Have you ever wondered about the consequences of people that try to follow God versus people that don't care about following God? Well, you've probably lived through some of that, but we're going to talk about it today from Proverbs chapter 29. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us, I just want to say welcome and thank you for being here with us today. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. And by the way, if you appreciate this ministry and content, at some point make sure and hit that subscribe button, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. Okay guys, welcome back. So we are in Proverbs 29. We're going to cover verses 1 through 11 today. So we're going to just jump right in. The Proverbs, as I've taught you guys before, um, they're a collection of general truths, not absolute truths, and you can kind of take them in pieces often. So even though you should check out the Proverbs series, hint, hint, um, you don't actually have to have had any of the previous section to understand what we're covering today, though I may refer to previous videos as we're getting toward the end of the book of Proverbs. Uh, there is a lot of repetition at this point. So I may refer to some of the previous ones. Okay, so let's get back into chapter 29, verse 1. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. And I I love, I'm messing up my words because I'm quoting it in my head in King James. I actually prefer, if I remember right, the King James says something like, and that without remedy. It's like emphasizing, and not only just broken, but broken without any possibility of repair or remedy. And really, this is kind of a common sense thing, because if God is judge, and he is, and if God sees all, he does, then someone who continually rejects God eventually they're going to fall under judgment. And if you continually rebel against God, even in judgment, it's just going to get harder on you. Now, sometimes we don't see this here on this earth. Sometimes it's only until heaven or hell. But even on this earth, someone who continually refuses to learn, someone who continually refuses to um, be pliable in God's hands, he's going to break them. He's going to do what it takes to show them humility. All right, verse 2. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Very true. A man who loves wisdom makes his father glad. But he who heaps company with harlots wastes his wealth. Very true. We've all seen this. This is kind of your playboy lifestyle rich kid, right? Just spends all the money and then doesn't have anything. The trust fund, your classic trust fund kid, right? Um, And by the way, not all trust fund kids are unwise. It's just the easy thing to poke fun at because it's so ridiculous. Um, And I think oftentimes they're more so that way because typically they weren't taught how to manage money. But I've known a few that uh, know how to manage money, have done very well with it and do very good things with it. So can't lump them all in there together. It's just the easy example. But a man who loves wisdom makes his father glad. Somebody who is, their parents can be proud of them versus the playboy that just ends up ruining everything and losing everything. The king gives stability to the land by justice, but a man who takes bribes overthrows it. This is directly connected to verse 2, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, people groan. Directly connected, the king gives stability to the land by justice. The purpose of a ruler is to make sure that justice is done, to make sure that right is right and wrong is wrong, and that the nation as a rule, as a, as a rule, as a whole, is doing the right thing. And ideally, a leader should lead people toward Christ. But even aside from that, God puts government in place to restrain evil. When a a government no longer restrains evil, that is an evil government. And it causes all kinds of problems The people groan. The man who takes bribes overthrows it. I'm not getting into the political stuff of the modern day because this video is going to be a lot longer than just this short period of time that we are living in, but we see this illustrated in life at, at various points. How about I word it that way? All right. 
Um, a man who flatters his neighbor, verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. A man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. I've already talked about flattery in previous sections, I think 27 especially. Um, I don't remember, but you can go back and look on your own and then look for the video because I don't remember for sure which one that was. Um, but yeah, look out, be careful of the one who flatters, right? Um, that's usually someone who has evil intentions. Not always, but usually. Flattery in scripture is not a good thing. In America, we use flattery slightly differently. It didn't used to be a good thing at all. But in the modern day, um, people don't always mean something negative by the word flattery. Verse 6, by transgression, an evil man is ensnared. He falls into his own issues there, his own, uh, his own net, so to speak. But the righteous sings and rejoices. Well, if you're caught in, in, if you're ensnared in something, you're not usually happy in singing. So there's again this compare and contrast between the two. Verse 7, the righteous is concerned for the rights of the poor. So in the modern day, you've got all this social justice uh, stuff. I have to word it that way. Um, a Christian has no choice biblically but to be concerned about social justice. But the way that our society is defining social justice is not right. We have no choice but to be concerned about the rights of the poor. The wicked does not understand such a concern. See, those who are wicked might use the poor to their own benefit, hold them up as trophies, see we're doing good, we're helping, but in reality they're not. There's a certain organization that has gained great notoriety. See, I don't have a choice but to get into some of this, but I don't want this to be a political channel, but I can't help but teach to some of the current circumstances either. There is an organization that has gained great notoriety over the last year and a half, especially maybe as much as two years, great notoriety in terms of being a huge organization that is swinging its weight all over the place, supposedly standing up for a certain people group that um, is, is supposedly unre underrepresented, etc., and supposedly this organization is all about making sure that that people group um, is, is protected, and yet not one single dollar, not one dollar from that organization has actually gone to the people group they're claiming to help. The righteous is concerned for the rights of the poor. The wicked does not understand such a concern. See, wicked people are gonna use the poor. Righteous people, we are commanded by God to help and be concerned about the rights of the poor. Now. That's not the sluggard. We talked about that in one of the previous videos recently. Somebody that doesn't want to work, that just expects everything to be handed to them, let reality be their teacher. That's, that is biblical and that is fair and right and just. But someone who just genuinely needs help, we're commanded to help them. There is a difference there, contrary to popular um, attention that the media wants us to believe. Let me word it that way. Verse 8, scorners set a city aflame. Oh, how appropriate for the modern day. Scorners set a city aflame, but wise men turn away anger. See, when you're wise, you know that burning and looting and all of that, and, and I, previously I would have taught this as a figurative aflame, but in the modern last year and a half, year, year and a half, two years, this is literal. Wise people know that that doesn't accomplish anything. The only thing it accomplishes is destroying more lives. Scorners set a city aflame, but wise men turn away anger. See, you learn that your anger should motivate you, not control you. That's the difference. When a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages or laughs, and there is no rest. Again, we've seen that played out in the press in the last year or two. When a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages or laughs. You can't communicate with a fool because by definition, a fool is someone who refuses to listen. No amount of logic and reason is going to help because they're the five-year-old that had their ears plugged in. La, 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 I'm not listening. We're seeing that lived out. That's the definition of a fool. Men of bloodshed hate 
the blameless. Again, we're seeing that lived out. People who just want to do bad stuff will use any excuse to have it happen. Men of bloodshed hate the blameless. That's why you see these roving groups of people going and attacking people who are doing nothing to them. Men of bloodshed hate the blameless, but the upright are concerned for his life. It's not what you say that demonstrates your heart. It's what you do that demonstrates your heart. If you want to know whether a movement is a good one or not, look at what they are doing and accomplishing, not the words that they're saying. Even though the words are important, what they're doing is going to show you where their heart really is. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. A fool always loses his temper but a wise man holds it back. See, wisdom teaches you to restrain anger and foolishness and all of the emotion that you just want to lash out. A fool, they don't know what restraint is. A foolish person just vents everything and destroys everything in their path, setting it aflame. All right, guys, that's it for today. I try so hard to make sure I'm teaching you accurately and in a relevant way, but I don't want this to become political. So please don't start the political stuff down in the comments. I'm really not interested in that as much as I am you understanding how to apply the Bible to what's going on in life today. So as always, if you appreciate this ministering content, hit that like button, hit subscribe, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. I'd love to have you as part of our family. And if you want to support this ministry, the two best ways, number one, hit that share button and otherwise interact with the video. That show shows YouTube that it's valuable and they will share it with more people. So hitting that share button and sharing it on social media, making sure you hit like, and commenting down below are the ways that you show value to this video. And if you want to support the ministry financially, there is a link down in the description. Any gift, even only a dollar or so a month, is appreciated and helpful as it adds up. And again, Again, does help the ministry. So give as you feel led, whether that be nothing, something, or a lot. Do whatever you feel led, and we appreciate you for it. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you very much, and God bless.